He has not changed. His love has not gotten less. His desire to care for his children, if anything, has increased, but has not changed. So when we read about God, Jehovah, Lord God, however it may be worded in the text today, just think about the God that you are thinking of today in your own life, who cares for you, who loves you, who provides for you, and hopefully saved you. Let's pray one more time before Bob comes up. Father, we thank you that you are immortal, that you are invincible, that you are mighty, unchanging, loving, merciful, that you are truth. Lord, we continue to ask for your presence to be with us today. As we're looking at your word, as you're speaking through your messenger, Bob, today, that you'll speak to us. And that whatever word you send out may accomplish everything that you desire to accomplish today. We pray for any that may be here that do not know you as Lord and Savior, that does not have a relationship with you. We pray that, Lord, you will prick their hearts and their ears and their minds. Show them their need for Jesus. And we pray that this might be their day of salvation. And Lord, we pray that you'll speak and address your children today and that you'll build them up from your word and from this teaching. Be with Bob as he comes, Lord. We pray a blessing upon him and for strength in his body. And we thank you and love him and thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick thought that uh, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, just uh, somebody asked me if we were going to be preaching a Easter service and I, an Easter sermon, or just sticking to Exodus where we are. And I'll just suggest to you that yes, we're preaching an Easter sermon from Exodus. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, just uh, uh, making a note of that for you and. Uh, just a uh, opportunity right now to read the scriptures for today. Uh, our scripture reading is uh, found in the sixth chapter of uh, Exodus, and uh, starting with the first verse. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them, referring to the Hebrew people, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as, as God Almighty. Uh, many of you will have a footnote, possibly, for the word God Almighty there, which is El Shaddai. Okay, so when he spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he, he identified himself as El Shaddai, God, or God Almighty. But, my, but by my name, the Lord... I did not make myself known to them. In other words, the, the phrase, I am that I am, they never got to hear that phrase. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered uh, uh, by my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses.
because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am uncircumcised, I have for I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And I think I'll just stop right there. Um, the genealogy that goes on is, is lengthy, and uh, I will talk about that a little bit while we are in our message this morning. So that's the scripture for the, for, uh, that we'll be working from t- uh, today. We also have uh, our question for the youth, and it's uh, question number 24 uh, in their catechism. It says, why was it necessary for Christ, the Redeemer, to die? And the, re- the answer to that, we can read together. Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and the penalty of sin and bring us back to God. Amen. The children are dismissed. We left off last week in chapter 5 with uh, Pharaoh not being willing to let the people go, as you recall. Uh, Moses speaks boldly and, and uh, to Pharaoh to let uh, the people go, and Pharaoh's response was, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So his defiance there, uh, which shows us, by the way, his heart was already hardened. Now, we'll see several times through Exodus where it says God hardened Moses' heart. Uh, What that basically is saying is that God uh, allowed it to get harder. He didn't do anything to intervene or stop it. And uh, what happens to us is basically God, the way he hardens a heart is he turns us over to the things that that corrupt us if that's the only thing we'll pursue. He'll he'll turn us ultimately over to those things. And uh, that hardens our hearts. So uh, Israel has been slaves in Egypt. Uh, we're not sure exactly how long. Some of the books that will say, well, they've been there for 430 years and they've been slaves. But under the pharaoh that they went to when they was there, uh, the first pharaoh, uh, they were not slaves. They had the land of Goshen, which was uh, some of the most productive land of Egypt. And they were guests and considered uh, honored people to be there. And the, the, the subsequent pharaoh saw them as a threat because they weren't Egyptian that they might align themselves with an enemy of Egypt in, in a war situation, and so took them over as slaves and confiscated their land and everything else and, and caused it to uh, the tables to turn. And so they've been slaves, though, for generations, nonetheless. And it's been a miserable time. And then in, in, as Moses went to Pharaoh and asked for uh, time to go and worship in the wilderness and come back, Pharaoh says, well, if you've got enough time to do that, that means that you've got enough time to do extra work. And that's when he added the work dimension of, of, as they were making the bricks, for instance, those that were making the bricks, they had to go and glean their own straw rather than having it brought to them. And that just added to the labor, and it made it more difficult. And all of the Egyptians, uh, uh, or all the Israelite slaves, found themselves under more tasks than they had been before. And so they were bitter. They were angry. And they actually were angry with Moses. Uh, let's, uh, as you look at the uh, uh, scripture in uh, chapter 5, this is a sense of review. Uh, it's uh, after the foreman of the Hebrew people had met with Pharaoh, trying to get, them, get him to lighten up a little bit. And Pharaoh said, no way, basically. Uh, as they came out, they met with Moses and Aaron. And verse 20, it says in chapter 5, he met with Mo- o- Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they, the Hebrew people, said to them, Moses and Aaron, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. In other words, you've made us a foul odor in the sight of Pharaoh. We come in and Pharaoh looks at us and, and holds up his head, basically. And 
we, you, we are not we in, in the same thing in front of his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. The sword being all of this extra labor would be shortening their lives, causing them to uh, great distress in their families. And so basically they're looking at Moses and saying, thanks a lot. Look what you have done to us. Uh, and it's, you know, harder work, more work to, uh, on them and, and, and terrible conditions. And so God, you know, Moses comes to before the Lord and he, he basically pleads, you know, this is a mess. It's, nothing has gone right. They haven't been delivered. They're still slaves. And now they're all this extra work. And, and basically kind of a woe is me. And I may, am I the wrong guy for the job is implied in it. And so God says very clearly, and I know I went over this verse last week as well, but verse 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Notice who it is that's going to do it to Pharaoh. It's God. It's not Moses. It's not Aaron. It's what I, God, will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, when this is all said and done, with a strong hand, Pharaoh, he, will send them, the Hebrew people, out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. In other words, he's going to say, leave, get out. We're done. Your God wins. Your God is greater than my God. See what I will do. And Moses, as we will see, isn't really sure what's happening. In verse 2 of chapter 6, God emphasizes it again. I am the Lord. The I am reflecting to the burning bush. God identifying himself. I am the Lord. And he, this again is where he says that I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But my name, the Lord, or the I am the Lord, I didn't use with them. I am the burning bush name that God identified himself with. He says, is, is identifying me with my covenant, with, what, with Canaan, with the promises that are going to, to bring to the, the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and he says, I've heard the groaning of the people. I have remembered my covenant. So God is trying to get Moses to understand. I haven't forgotten anything that I have promised. I still am in charge. I am that I am the God of all creation. There's nothing here that I can't handle. Moses is still overwhelmed, though. But God goes on. He says, I've remembered my covenant. I've remembered my people. And so he wants them in verse 6. Look what he, what he says. Chapter 6, verse 6. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you out. The burdens will be left behind. It goes on. I will deliver you from slavery to them. Notice the emphasis here. I will. God is making a very powerful statement here. I'm going to do this. When he uses I will, it is saying it's now, a, it's in writing, so to speak. It's, it's going to be done. It's as if it has been done. So his word stands. I'm going to deliver you from slavery. I'm going to, he goes on, you know, I'm going to deliver you out from under the burdens. And then he goes to another one. I will redeem you with the outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring you out from under the burdens. I'm going to deliver you from slavery. Verse 7. I will take you to be my people. Very specific picture here. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know. In other words, there's not going to be anything to doubt here. That I am the Lord your God. Again, I am is being used over and over again here. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
bringing them out. He's delivering them. He's redeeming them. He's calling them his people. He's saying, I will be your God. And then I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, God made a promise to them. And he says, it will be done. You can count on it. It's going to happen. I will give you the land. I will, and he ultimately says, I will give it to you for a possession. And then he says, I am the Lord. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 6 real quickly. He says, I am the Lord. And then he starts these phrases. I will do this. I will do that. There's seven phrases, I will do. Seven promises that God makes to them. And then he ends it again with, I am the Lord. He starts it with, I am the Lord. He finishes it with, I am the Lord. You, he, he can't get any more clear than this. Okay, this is what Moses is to, to go and tell the, the people of Israel. So the Lord said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, verse 10. Or, well, let's go to, to, to verse 9. Uh, Moses spoke this to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. There was nothing happening immediately. And as a result, they were just downtrodden. It's, they were looking down and not up. So Moses is instructed to go to them and to talk, but it says they wouldn't listen. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this land. Now Moses has done this already, and it's caused nothing but trouble for the people. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? And then a very strange phrase. For I am of uncircumcised lips we've gone from all of this very positive promises to Moses' response the people won't listen to me I, I'm obviously not the, their spokesman they don't, won't, won't receive me as that how is Pharaoh going to listen to me I'm a man of uncircumcised lips I'll tell you it's not easy to find out what that means it's not a phrase that is used frequently in the Bible for that matter and so it's, it's an awkward one This idea of uncircumcised lips is you've got to go back to the understanding of the law of circumcision given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This was what would identify the Hebrew people. The males were all circumcised. Well, here... Moses uses this phrase, uncircumcised lips, to show that he is not being received by the Hebrew people. He's being rejected. He's being treated as one who is uncircumcised. It's the implication of the phrase. In other words, he's being somewhat, in a sense, he's being treated like a Gentile. They won't have anything to do with him. They won't talk to him. They won't, and again, we get that very clearly. It says, they won't listen to me. Moses, this is your fault. What's happening to us? Leave us. We don't want anything to do with you. It's like they're, you know, you could almost say they've, they're, they're, what they're saying is, Hey, Moses, we haven't been delivered. We're getting more work. Hey, you've done enough. Thanks. Moses, by using again this phrase, is basically saying, I'm not part of what you're doing. I'm not part of the plan. It's not working. I'm the wrong man for the job. He's already implied this before, and now he's basically saying it with this phrase. I'm simply the wrong person. I'm not the right person for the job. Verse 13 but the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge. 
about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So he didn't let him off the hook. He let him complain, let it all out. And then he says, now, go and do what I told you to do. Okay, and I think it's important that you see here, we have yet to see God get angry with Moses as he wilts at various times. I find that really important for us to look at even as our walk today with the Lord. You know, maybe you've attempted a ministry and it didn't go well, uh, you know, and you feel like, oh, I don't know this isn't my thing or that isn't my thing. I want to suggest to you that all of us have been given gifts to serve God within the framework of the body of Christ. And so I want to encourage you to look for that gift, to pray for that gift, and, and then look for the opportunity to use it. But there's one thing that you can always be ready to do. Peter tells us to be ready to give a testimony in reference to our faith. Why is it you believe the way you believe? And it's really interesting for me because that's almost word for word the conversation I had with a person at a restaurant in Paradise, California. Only table that had an extra seat. And I sat, and uh, well, uh, he was at a table sitting for, uh, sat for four, and there was three of us, and we came in. My friends went back to their work, and I sat there with this guy for another hour and a half. This was not more than could have been more than a week after I told my wife, if any of our friends come over with their Bibles and start to talk to us, I will simply say I will be back and I will leave. And I'll go down to a particular place. You can call me when they're gone and I'll come home. And that was something that I would do. And then here in a freak snowstorm in May, Nobody wanted to clear the sidewalk. Decided everybody wanted to go to lunch at the brunch at the place called the brunch house. And here was this one guy sitting alone. And he was talking about things about the Lord. And I literally asked him, tell me why you believe what you believe. And he did. And the only challenge he gave to me after seeing where I was at was he said, read the Gospels with the understanding that they believed what they were writing. I'm not asking you to believe it, just that they were sincere in what they were writing. I've never been challenged about that before. Walked back to my shop, I'd walk across the street first to the bookstore and bought a Bible. I read the Gospel of John, that's when he told me to read. He didn't have me read it because it's the love gospel, which was the big thing at that time. But he had me read it because he felt it was the most coherent in a sense of the way I was thinking. And I read it, and I said, okay, I can see what the intensity that John is writing here. And I read the rest of the Gospels. Luke, Mark, Matthew. Backwards, of course. And I know I've shared this testimony many times, but I got home, and my wife, her typical statement was, how was your day? What did you do? And I told her I read the Gospels. You, I, I, I think I could have almost walked into her mouth. She just was like, you did what? And I said, yeah, I sat in the rocking chair that I was supposed to be repairing in the spray booth where there was plenty of light, and I read the gospel. By the way, there was no instantaneous thing. I started studying, and the thing that I wanted to find out was how they could buy into the resurrection. Not that they didn't believe, but how could they believe? And I, I started making that my, my goal, just to figure it out. Fortunately, Josh McDowell came out about the same time, and got to hear him speak at a university campus. And uh, it took another year and a half before I turned around and said, God, I think you're real. You really care. All because someone shared when I asked the question, why you believe the way you believe, he shared his faith. I want to encourage you to have an answer for that. If you've never thought about it as to how to answer that, it's a good thing worth studying and writing down. Your testimony is basically what we're talking about. Why, how Christ touched your life and why you believe the way you believe. A detour, but I think a necessary one. Moses is 
trying to figure out what's going on and how, what his place is going to be into this. And the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, and like I said, he gives them this charge. Go back and do what I've told you to do, basically. Now, verses 14 through 25 are genealogy. I am not going to read it. The genealogy was put there, I believe, really, for Moses and Aaron. In other words, I believe God spoke this to them. As he was talking with them, it seems to be part of the conversation that was going on. And what God is showing through this genealogy is he's showing what happened before Moses and Aaron, what was happening during with Moses and Aaron, and what was going to happen in the future. He covered past, present, and future in this genealogy. Moses and Aaron being somewhere in the middle of it. And God's basically saying, you're telling me you're not part of the story. I'm telling you, you are. Here, look at your genealogy. You are a Hebrew, and I am calling you. You are part of the story. You belong here. This is what you are to do. Your parts have already been written. And it brought me back to mind again what I mentioned the other uh, last week about the, the, the orchestration of God he, this, this was all understood before the foundation of the world. And, and, and it was already put into place. It was already the plan. And God has been leading this great, great orchestration, this great symphony, if you will, piece by piece. And each one of us plays a part. And now we're to Moses and Aaron's part. He says, you are a part of it. Here's your, your place and time. What he says in verse 26 at the end of the genealogy, he's referring to Aaron and Moses being mentioned in here and, and their birth and, and then their lineage besides. And it says, these, referring to Aaron and Moses, are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This Moses and this Aaron. God says, I'm not making, basically, I'm not making a mistake here. You are the ones who have been called. You were called before the foundation of the world to do this, and it is your calling. It is what I have put you here for, and everything that has led up to this point has been orchestrated to bring you face to face to Pharaoh so that I can show Pharaoh who he is not, and show him who I am and bring the Hebrew people out of bondage. I have a plan, Moses, and you and Aaron are an intricate part of it. You belong here. Verse 28. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. Verse 30. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? In other words, I haven't seen any change in the people. I'm still not accepted by them. How is this going to happen? How is this going to work? He's still the reluctant servant. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't feel he is the man to do this. He gives Moses the charge again, and he comes back with the same argument he had before. God is patient. Every one of us sitting in this room today, if you've confessed Christ in your heart and you believe that he is the Son of God, then God has blessed you. You are saved, and he has been patient with you. I don't know all of your histories, but I know yours isn't uncommon to man in general. And at some point, very early in your life, you willfully made a choice to sin. You knew something was wrong, and you did it anyway. Now, the standard question I normally ask you here is, is, how many of you died that day? Well, 
There's two ways of looking at that. There's the spiritual context. But generally, I'm speaking to the general picture of what is the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death, meaning you die physically. How many of you died the day you sinned first? And we're sitting here still. So the answer is obvious. God is patient. I can't imagine he hasn't lost his patience with Moses at this point. But he knows how it goes. And he knows what's going to ultimately happen. You see, God's already got the plagues planned. He needs those plagues to happen in order for Pharaoh to see God's hand and the power that God has. Pharaoh thinks he has all the power of the world. Pharaoh thinks he has the strongest army in the world. And as far as the world around him is concerned, that's true. But God says he's nothing compared to me. Pharaoh can wear all the cobras on his hat, on his crown that he wants, and he can worship the animals and the, other, and the, and the false gods all he wants, and he can see himself as a god if he wants. But I am the Lord God. And God's going to teach that to Pharaoh. Brings us back to chapter 6, verse 1. Now you will see what I am going to do with Pharaoh. I wrote a thought to myself here that I just share with you. Again, if you've confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead, that he is the Savior of the body of Christ, the church. If you've confessed this, you are saved. That's what Paul says, period. And so where do you fit in? And I'm just going to suggest to you, it's not are you part of the story, but what is my part in the story? I say it again. It's not that you are part of the story. You know, are, are you, you know what, what's my part? What's, what's it going to be? Uh, it, it, it's what is my part? I have a part. And what's it going to be? And I can't answer that for you. That's between how you and God work and pray together and, 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 and how you read the scriptures to lead you. Uh, but I wrote for in a general format here. Are you a son or a daughter? Are you a mother or a father? Are you a brother or a sister? A husband or a wife? What does the Bible tell you about these relationships? Put it around to just about as, as basic as I could put it here. Are you breathing? Is your heart beating? Your response is, Lord, here I am. Use me. I'm not telling you how to use me. I'm asking you to use me. Cause me to be the servant you need where you need me. And it might not be where you are most comfortable. It may not be where you thought you would go. I will tell you with all my heart, the last place I would have ever expected to see me was in a pulpit. I have an uncle who wondered about it for years. What is it that Bob's getting out of this? He knew me as a child and, a, and, a, and as a teenager and as a young adult. And it wasn't until I did my dad's funeral that my uncle came up to me and said, you really believe all this, don't you? Don't put any limits. Don't put any restrictions. Don't make any assumptions. Just simply say, here I am, Lord. Use me. And who knows, you might be sitting at, at uh, Peppers and somebody comes and sits next to you and s says, I... I, I known you for a long time and I know you go to church why be ready be asked be ready to share why things are different for you what has Jesus done in your life that makes you say you are Lord it's what the world needs to find out it's what the world needs to hear In Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and 5, we find the people getting together, singing hymns, and, and worshiping together, and fellowshipping together. And that is a critical part of us growing in the Lord together. 
encouraging one another together. Not forsaking fellowship, coming together. And it's not to undo what people have, have become accustomed to doing uh, over the last few years, especially because of COVID. But there's nothing like this togetherness. Fellowship in the same building at the same time, singing together, worshiping together, and opening the Word together. And we're encouraged to do that. And then that as well, in the book of Acts, it says that they were gathering together and breaking bread together as often as they met. And we break bread every Sunday together. That's communion. And with communion, we celebrate what God has done. He is God. He has saved us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word revealed to us who the Father is. And we celebrate communion. The words, it is finished. Letting us know that God patiently brought us through all the things He's brought us through so that we could come to the words to, rest, to the point where we would rest under that phrase, it is finished. Knowing that our sins have been covered through the blood of Christ on the cross. And at the same time, celebrate the resurrection because Jesus says He will do this again when He returns so we know He's coming back. While we sing the song for communion this morning, uh, I invite you to come up and pick up the communion here up front. Go back to your seats, hold it until you've all been served, and we'll share it together. Emmanuel, the 
rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. respect to communion to the church in Corinth. I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us share the bread together. He goes on. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us share. Once again, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share in the Lord's table the emblems that represent what you have done for us. I think of the phrase in that song that the, the veil is torn. We are invited into the Holy of Holies because of what you have done. We don't deserve to be there. But through your grace, your mercy, your love, the work on the cross that you did for us, the perfect sacrifice. As we confess you and believe in you, we are allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And not just to visit, but to dwell there with you. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you for what you have done for us, what you continue to do for us, and we look for the day where we are with you eternally, face to face. Until that time, Lord, cause us to be what you need us to be, where we are, where you put us, that we might be bold for you. Again, thanking you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Go with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand as we close, please. Go ahead, Ted.
benediction that I share with you as a benediction today. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. May the Lord be with you all. And may you go with the peace of God. God bless you. Have a good week. Looking forward to coming together again on Easter Sunday and celebrating the resurrection again as we get to do every Sunday. God bless you.